eating healthy in the end times. Good morning and happy Sabbath. So that's the sermon title. And the reason I researched this is I feel like I need to eat healthier myself. And I'm sure we can all benefit from learning what the Bible says about a healthy lifestyle. So the four topics we're going to cover are eating habits from creation onward, making food a religion, what about dessert, cheese, caffeinated drinks, real meat, and processed fake meat, and eating at the end of time. And just a heads up, I'm not going to tell anybody or say that the Bible says like we shouldn't eat cheese or ice cream or any of that, but I think as we get closer to the second coming, it's a good idea to be more careful about what we eat and try to be more health conscious. And hopefully this sermon will not spoil today's potluck meal. <laughs> Hopefully the potluck will be only raw food, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, let's say a prayer. <laughs> Dear Jesus, please be with us as we study what you said in the Bible about healthy eating and about how our body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. And yeah, just please open our minds and help it to be a blessing. In your name, amen. amen. So eating habits from creation onward. In the first chapter of the Bible, God laid out the ideal diet for mankind. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which the fruit of the tree is yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. When God said, Behold, that means he's, what he says next is very important. I really like the old King James that says that. So God gave Adam permission to eat fruit and also to eat any plant that bore seeds. That includes most vegetables. So some people take this verse and they try to say that Adam and Eve had only a raw food diet, but I'm sure they learned how to cook food eventually. And research shows that a diet consisting of vegetables is really healthy. And I found this quote from the Mayo Clinic. It was interesting. There's two parts. This is part one. A plant-based diet which emphasizes fruit, vegetables, grains, beans, and nuts is rich in fiber, vitamins, and other nutrients. And people who don't eat meat, vegetarians, generally eat fewer calories and less fat, weigh less, and have a lower risk of heart disease than non-vegetarians do. Even reducing meat intake has a protective effect. Research shows that people who eat red meat are at an increased risk of death from heart disease, stroke, or diabetes. Processed meats also increase the risk of death from these diseases. And what you don't eat can also harm your health. Diets low in nuts, seeds, fruits, and vegetables also increase the risk of death. And later in the sermon, I'll talk about processed fake meat. I guess even the fake meat isn't always the healthiest thing. So if humans only ate fruits and vegetables, we would all be very healthy, and there'd be no reason for this sermon. But we know that's not the case. Unfortunately, after Adam and Eve lived in the garden for a while, sin entered the world. And Lucifer took the form of a snake, convinced Eve to eat a fruit, and legend says it was an apple. So you guys know what happened next, 1,650 years of debauchery. So God had Noah build an ark. And after the ark stopped and the flood waters receded, God made a declaration. He said, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as a green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So it's kind of cool, you know, right after the waters receded, there was no, they didn't have a garden planted or anything. So God provided them with the clean animals he'd brought on the ark. And I remember hearing from Pastor Binford, I think I asked him, like, so do people eat really healthy up in northern Alaska where he was a missionary? <laughs> and he said, like, you know, they have to eat meat because that's the only thing they have to eat up there, really. Like if you get grapes or vegetables or fruit brought into Alaska, some of it's kind of old because they can't grow it up there. So I had an interesting quote from Patriarchs and Prophets on this. Before this time, God had given man no permission to eat animal food. He intended that the race should subsist wholly upon the production of the earth. But now that every green thing had been destroyed, he allowed them to eat the flesh of the clean beast that had been preserved in the ark. So one thing we know is that eating meat wasn't part of God's original plan, but it's something he allowed to happen in a sinful world. And this kind of stuff happened other times in the Bible, like Moses allowed divorce. The patriarchs in the Bible had many wives, and the nation Israel got a king. And so as we prepare for the soon coming of Jesus, 
I believe that maybe we should eat less unhealthy food, it includes like candy and dessert and you know processed foods and stuff like that. And I'm not going to look at unclean foods like pork or seafood or alcohol or tobacco because I'm sure you guys are well familiar with that. And you guys have heard of the verse in Proverbs that says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 21.1. So the first topic I want to talk about is making food a religion. And I feel like in, or people in Wisconsin are a little bit religious about cheese, <laughs> which I am too, I guess. <laughs> But you can't go to any kind of event like a county fair or the local store without finding cheese curds for sale. <laughs> and I never really, I like cheese, but I never really like cheese curds. But um, a lot of people love to eat meat too. It's kind of like a passion. And you know, people that are vegan or vegetarian, some of them are passionate about it too. Like there's kind of a joke, like a lot of people that are vegan, they can't help but to tell you about it, <laughs> even if you don't want to know about it. <laughs> so I found just a couple pictures on the internet that I thought were a little bit funny. My wife didn't think they were that funny, but it says the hardest part about being vegan is having to wake up at 5 a.m. to milk the almonds. <laughs> but <laughs> so that's why my wife looks so tired today. <laughs> and then there is this other one that really struck me as funny. It says, this meat eater says, dear vegetarians, if you're trying to save the animals, why are you eating their food? <laughs> so <laughs> these memes are interesting. There's a lot of back and forth between the two groups. But it's important to remember we need to be Christian. Even if people decide to eat differently than you, we need to be kind and loving and not judge others. We are all on a different journey with the same destination. Paul says, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat dis him or judge him who does eat, for God has received him. And it also is important to remember that we cannot eat our way to heaven. That's salvation by works. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. So let's not make a religion out of what we eat. But if we open our hearts, perhaps God will guide us in this area to make some better choices. So I decided to look at um, number three. It says, what about dessert, cheese, caffeinated drinks, real meat, and processed fake meats? And I looked at those. And I felt like some of those things are what I struggle with. Some of us may be struggling with those things. And so number one, I have reasons why people eat dessert. Obviously, it tastes delicious. And then it gives us a short-term energy or mood boost. And... I'm sure some of you guys might have enjoyed getting ice cream this summer. <laughs> My favorite, I get a chocolate vanilla swirl because it's cheap, but, <laughs> but it's really tasty. I like it. So I was unaware of this, but I looked up some facts about ice cream, and apparently it's a bit of a drug. It says, ice cream stimulates the thrombotonin, which is a hormone of happiness and helps in reducing the levels of stress in the body. Well, that makes sense. It makes me happy. So... Ice cream is made of milk, which contains L-tryptophan, which is a natural tranquilizer and helps in relaxing the nervous system. But it doesn't seem to work on kids. Like, you give them ice cream, they're super hyper afterwards. So, <laughs> so that's pretty crazy. And I read on this website called eatthis.com, there's all different kinds of negative things happen from ice cream. They said it can affect your mood and brain health. It can lead to obesity if you eat too much. And it said if you eat a massive bowl in one sitting, it can even stop your heart. But that's probably an extreme example. So the good news about sweet treats is that God created sugar. In Genesis 1.9, he says, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth. And most edible plants such as corn, beets, and sugar cane have natural sugar contained within them. But God locked the sugar in a fiber matrix within the plant. So when we eat the plant... We receive the goodness of fiber to keep our digestive systems running smoothly. Plus, the sugar is released slowly so the body can process it efficiently. Unfortunately, scientists took corn, beets, and sugar cane that God made and removed the fiber, processing the resulting juice into sugar, which is the fine white powder we know today. And the Bible doesn't really talk a lot about sugar directly, 
But the closest it does come to mentioning it is when it references honey. Oops. There we go. Oh, I went. And honey has about the same sweetness level as processed sugar. However, honey has other benefits such as trace levels of nutrients and antimicrobial properties. It has even been used to heal wounds. So you can eat a lot of honey, you don't get sick. It's really healthy for you. And the Bible encourages the consumption of honey. From Proverbs it says, My son, eat thou honey because it is good, and a honeycomb which is sweet to thy taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be into thy soul. When thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. And the funny thing is, back in Bible time, just like today, people had problems with consuming too much sweet food. From Proverbs 25, 16, 27, Has thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. It is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory. So I believe desserts and stuff that have processed white sugar, one of the things we should maybe eat a little bit less of as we prepare for Jesus to come. All right, reasons why people eat cheese. Number one, it supports the dairy industry in Wisconsin. Number two, it has a natural tranquilizer that makes you feel good. Number three, it's packed with vitamins essential for bone health. And number four, it tastes delicious on pizza or pretty much anything. <laughs> And I had a really hard time finding anything negative about cheese because it's amazing. You search Google now for stuff like this, and all you get is positive results because everything's been co-opted by the big corporations, I think. So helping out local farmers is good, and you always feel good after eating cheese, although I have eaten a whole pizza by myself. I didn't feel so good. <laughs> so when we look at what the Bible says about cheese, there's not much there. Job said to God, did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Which kind of sounded like a punishment. We talked about that in Sabbath school. And we know the Israelites ate cheese from 1 Samuel. And Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an ephop of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousands and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Sounds like it was kind of a reward for the, you know, the leader, like not something everybody just ate regularly. And then in 2 Samuel 17, when David was fleeing Absalom, some friendly people brought him cheese and supplies. So the Bible doesn't say much about eating cheese, but I don't know if that means we should eat a big pizza every night. And scripture may not reference it directly, but there's many general texts about health we can also apply to the topic. 1 Corinthians, written by Paul, says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So the fact is that eating cheese can be a little bit addicting. Personally, I've tried to stop a couple of times in my life, and I wasn't always so successful. <laughs> and so here's a quote I read. My mom just told me about this. Actually, it was pretty crazy. It says, cheese has morphine-like compounds called casomorphins that attach to the brain's opiate receptors, making the food even harder to resist than its high levels of fat and salt already do on their own. But a greater danger of eating cheese is that it leads to high cholesterol levels. From a British website, cheese is a great source of protein and calcium, but is often high in saturated fat and salt. This means eating too much could lead to high cholesterol and high blood pressure, increasing your risk of cardiovascular disease. So I just think cheese is one of those things maybe we should eat a little bit less of as the end of time approaches. And personally, what I struggle with cheese, like I used to like to keep the bag of shredded cheese around the house. Then you start to put it, I like to put some on my noodles with tomato sauce, but then you start to pour more and more and more. <laughs> and just kind of hard to stop. And that's called gluttony, and overeating becomes easy. But the Bible speaks very strongly against this. In Philippians 3, 18 and 19, we read, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destructive, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. 
And overeating can cloud our senses and put us in a dangerous place. Satan's agents are always looking to take advantage of us. And uh, Proverbs 23, 1 and 2 says, When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you're given to appetite. So the next topic I was looking at, reasons why people drink coffee. And it keeps you awake, it tastes good with sugar added, and it has some health benefits. Um, there's cocoa beans, and yeah, there are some benefits. And I've had a caffeinated drinks here and there, like when I was driving overnight, sometimes you just want to stay awake. But it didn't really affect me that much. I'm just, I guess I'm just too big of a guy. But <laughs> so I think it's good to be careful with caffeinated drinks. Like one of my best friends, I don't know if he still does it, but he used to just drink Mountain Dew all the time, which isn't good for your teeth. So I did a little research into caffeine to see, you know, what it was about. And this is from addictioncenter.com. And it says, Caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant that has the ability to enhance concentration and boost the mood. Many people feel like they need caffeine in the morning to increase alertness and motivation to work. More than 90% of adults regularly drink caffeine in the U.S., consuming an average of 200 milligrams of caffeine per day, the equivalent of five 12-ounce cans of soft drink. Usually, drinking caffeinated beverages is relatively safe. However, when the need for caffeine crosses the line from a pleasant pick-me-up to a daily necessity, addiction is possible. If someone drinks caffeine on a daily basis, they will develop a tolerance just as they would to other drugs or alcohol. After a while, the user requires more and more caffeine to produce the same effects of alertness. I guess the downsides of having it every day is it kind of loses its effectiveness. And my cousin, I think she really liked coffee, but she started to develop headaches. I think that's pretty common, too. So the verse we read earlier in 1 Corinthians uh, 6.12 applies to this. It says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. But it is important to know that God, we serve an amazing God. He will help us overcome any kind of addiction to any kind of drink. And 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And I'm thankful the Bible has a lot of encouraging texts about how God can strengthen us and give us energy. I don't know. Do you guys ever have trouble getting out of bed in the morning? <laughs> it seems like everybody's different. <laughs> I just kind of wake up and get up. But... <laughs> So that's why I think a lot of people drink coffee. But Paul wrote, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me, Colossians 1.29. And there's a couple of great verses from Isaiah and the Philippians. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength, Isaiah 40.29. And Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So that might be encouraging to somebody if they're trying to give up, um, you know, not drinking Mountain Dew quite as often. So lastly, I have reasons why people eat meat. <laughs> and I almost convinced myself to eat meat with all these reasons, but <laughs> it was a little dangerous. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, I love fake meat. Anyways, which has bad side effects as well. So readily available in survival situations high in vitamin B12 and protein, tastes delicious, good alternatives aren't always available, sometimes cheaper than fake meat, to be more manly, to save food after eating or hunting, and for family holidays. And meat eating is a very common practice. Like I mentioned in Alaska, some places there's not much, much else to eat. And if you're ever in a survival situation, it's kind of hard to survive off dandelions or greens. It's a lot easier to survive. You can catch a fish. So I didn't find any verses in the Bible that said, you know, like flat out meat eating is wrong. They did say some stuff like you don't want to eat it with all the blood in it. And if you remember, it, I read back a while ago, it started with God's approval in Genesis. He said, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, just as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And Jesus fed meat, and he didn't, have a, didn't seem to have a problem with it. Matthew 15, and Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? They said, 
seven and a few small fish. And directing a crowd to sit on the ground, he took seven loaves and fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. However, something else that the Bible says that is important is Paul writes that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and we need to be very careful not to defile this temple. And Paul says, Know ye not that ye are, or know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. And a few chapters later, Paul offers clarity on this topic. He says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And unfortunately, a lot of has changed in this world since the Bible times and the disciples ate fish from the hands of Christ. The world is waxing older and older like a garment and getting more polluted. And one problem is that a lot of the lakes in the world contain mercury. And this is a direct result of burning coal for energy, which sends harmful toxins up into the air. Then the mercury falls in the lakes with the rain. And the mercury then bioaccumulates and sticks in the fatty tissues of animals. So bioaccumulates means when, you know, like one animal eats another animal and the amount of mercury keeps growing. Since humans are at the top of the food chain, that means we get the largest portion of mercury poison. We eat too much fish. So I was reading about this. I don't know if you guys heard of Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota, but some people, they go up there and they eat nothing but fish for two weeks. <laughs> and this one guy, he had a similar experience. And yeah, if you eat too much fish, you can get a little... Uh, mercury poison. He, this guy way overdid it. Like having a fish once or you know twice a week probably won't have any bad side effects. So here's his personal account I read online. Hmm. There, I think there was a. Hmm. Oh, does it go back at all? Or it should go back. There, there used to be a picture of a guy with a tuna there. <laughs> So here is a personal account I read online. Fish advisories are there for a reason. Myself, like most people, have ignored them. That was until I had health problems. My problem came from months of eating albacore tuna once or twice a day. In addition to other fish three to four times a week, I started getting a dizzy feeling and getting a tingling feeling in my hands and feet. My doctor checked my mercury levels. They were highly elevated. I have had to drastically cut my fish consumption to get my levels to a healthy level. And I'm sure you guys have heard the saying, like, you are what you eat. I read, uh, it said, since the 1950s, FDA has approved a number of steroid hormone drugs for the use in beef, cattle, and sheep, including natural estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and their synthetic versions. And so I'm sure the billion-dollar corporations say there's nothing wrong with eating meat with steroids in it. But, you know, it's good there's lots of healthier alternatives. So there's grass-fed beef. There's all kinds of healthier alternatives. And a couple of years ago, there was a, kind of like a craze that swept America. People were getting really excited about the Impossible Burger. And they were getting really excited about investing in those companies, too. <laughs> but the burger was engineered to look and taste exactly like meat. A lot of people ate these to find something healthier. And perhaps, you know, they are a little healthier than meat. But I read they aren't quite as healthy as eating vegetables. I found this interesting quote. It says, just because a burger is made from plants instead of animals doesn't automatically make it healthier for you. Compared to a meat-based burger, Beyond and Impossible contain roughly the same amount of saturated fat and more sodium, both of which, when overconsumed, can increase the risk of heart disease and stroke. In terms of nutrition labels, most of these seem comparable with the meat foods that they are trying to replace, referring primarily to the amount of protein, fat, calories, and sodium in both. It's important to remember that the point of comparison is a sausage, not a carrot. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> they're healthy, but they're not like healthy like eating vegetables. So to find healthier burgers, I recommend the black bean burgers from Aldi's, but I don't think they taste that great, but <laughs> they would be healthier. So going back to the Bible, Paul said, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are the God's. And remember, I'm sure you guys remember back in the Old Testament, the Israelites built a sanctuary, which was a temple for God to reside in. 
And remember all the ceremony that took place and how sacred the most holy place was? When you consider that our bodies, specifically our minds, are like a holy place, a temple of the Holy Ghost, I think that means we should, you know, be careful about what we eat. And also being bought with a price means that Jesus died for us. So it's important to glorify God with our body. All right, number three, eating at the end of time. So as things on this earth get crazier and crazier, I'm sure you guys have read the news lately, we want to prepare ourselves to be ready for Christ's coming. And eating healthy is one way we can do that. We have a healthy diet. That means our minds are clear, and we can better hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us. By eating lots of green leafy vegetables, we can have better brain health. This is from Harvard University's website. It says, research shows the best brain foods are the same ones that protect your heart and blood vessels, including green leafy vegetables. Leafy greens such as kale, spinach, and broccoli are rich in brain healthy nutrients like vitamin K, folate, and beta carotene. Research su suggests that these plant-based foods may help slow cognitive decline. And clear minds will be needed to make wise choices at the end of time. And the best example of this, um, if we want to look back in the Bible to see a similar you know, thing happening, of course, is found in Daniel 1. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm sure you guys are well familiar with that story. But you can open your Bible there if you want to. So Ashpenaz, the king's eunuch, was commanded to find Israelites that were without blemish, good-looking, skillful in wisdom, understanding, and learning to teach them to stand in the king's palace. And these young men were given the same food and wine that King Nebuchadnezzar was given. So I'm going to read Daniel 1, 8, 11 through 13 and 20. It says, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Then Daniel said to the steward when the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. And then at the end of that, at the end of the ten days, verse 20, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. So Daniel and his friends, they kind of went through almost a little time of trouble, and they turned to vegetables and water. And I guess that served them well. And so someday we're going to go through a little time of trouble just like that. And according to what Jesus said, we're going to be brought before, you know, to court before the authorities and tested for our faith. So because Jesus is coming soon, it's a good idea to practice temperance and discipline in all the things we eat. Paul says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And it's good to be accustomed to regularly eating healthy food. Like, you know, when in a time of trouble, someday there's going to be no Taco Bell. <laughs> so we got to get used to eating just plain, simple things. Isaiah said, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of racks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. But what I'm really looking forward to is someday we're going to feast with Jesus in heaven. And I'm looking forward to that day because we're no longer going to have to worry about, you know, what the food has in it, if it has high fructose corn syrup or all these other weird things I put in it. So this is a part of a promise Jesus made to his disciples. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew 26, 29. And one last promise before we close from Revelation 19, 6 to 9. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So I'm really looking forward to that marriage supper and that day.